Final Fantasy VII Rebirth for PS5 is almost upon us, but with so much FF7 media out there, it can be easy to get a little lost. At the request of today's sponsor, Square Enix, I'm here to explain the FF7 saga of games to you. Whether you need a refresher after 27 years of FF7 content, or you're just dying to jump into Square's new massive, extravagant, action-packed RPG later this month on the 29th. A purchase link for which can be found down in the description below. They knew that the only man for this job was the guy who recorded 50 hours of Kingdom Hearts Final Mix off a of PS2 in Japanese to recap the story from a release perspective. There will be time codes down below, so you can skip to any part that you're most interested in hearing about. But anyway, let's go back to 1997. Sometimes, in the glow of its legend, the reasons Final Fantasy VII was such a phenomenon, amongst both gamers and in the mainstream, gets lost. But it's easy to be reminded by just booning it up why this game hooked so many immediately. The game kicks off at a breakneck speed with zero bullcrap. War drums building anticipation as in less than a minute, you're slamming into action as mercenary cloud strife. <laughs> executing a mission on behalf of the eco-terrorist organization Avalanche to blow up an energy reactor sucking the planet dry. In a world where the first fully CGI animated film was only two years old, flying out of the streets to a bird's eye view of a massive imposing future metropolis before floating down straight into the gameplay probably didn't hurt either. This RPG doesn't start with you getting to know some family members and friends you couldn't possibly begin to care about yet in some village, or with a king tasking you with taking on some noble quest. It's an RPG that starts paced like an action game. The mechanics here were a perfect combination of simple to learn with complexity to experiment with, allowing you to combine moves and abilities with modifiers to create all kinds of different effects that never stop scaling until you're unleashing ridiculous combos of magic attacks and counter moves that only remain balanced thanks to how ridiculous the threats get too. Another reason the game is so easy to get into for anyone is who we play as here. You're an ambivalent merc looking for some pay and some action, and your relationship with your employer slash partner in battle, Barrett, is fairly antagonistic. Cloud is a great surrogate then for the player. He has minimal opinions to express yet on the world we're in. You're not expected to immediately embody someone who cares about this mission or its outcomes yet. For now, it's good enough to enjoy the thrill of the action and passively absorb Barrett's ramblings about saving the planet. The game rapid fires situations and moods at you. You infiltrate, you fight a boss, you make a desperate escape, and then everything simmers down as you walk the streets of the city. Midgar, the double-decker metropolis. The amazing score paints the picture, a sad, melancholic place where the sun doesn't shine, but with the spirit of hope lingering as a harp punctuates the misery. Midgar seems like an incredibly crap place to live, thanks to this presentation, even before you fully understand the amount of blame the Shinra company deserves for it, a mega corporation polluting the planet with their Mako energy reactors. Mako being a power source, they suck directly out of the planet and then monopolize to control the city and the world with an iron fist. They have their own military, including a super soldier division called Soldier, and their own secret service with an impotent puppet mayor barely massaging the optics of this iron grip. But does this justify Barrett and his organization's terrorist activity? You're thrown in the middle, fairly ambivalent, with no great love for any player involved, and have to make up your mind yourself. Amidst this, Cloud has run-ins with Tifa, a girl who used to live next door to him as a child, a kickboxer in Avalanche who hates Shinra due to their hand in a personal tragedy, and Aerith, originally localized as Eris, a flower girl who tends to the scarce remaining plant life in Midgar. Just her penchant for trying to keep alive, what little vegetation there is left in Midgar puts her in conflict with Shinra. That and they also want to kidnap her. More playful and free-spirited, she contrasts with Tifa, who despite her more outwardly aggressive combat style is a little more sensible and reserved. Shinra soon kidnaps Aerith, when it turns out she's the last of an ancient race of people who could commune with the planet itself, a people referred to as the Ancients. So she's a major chess piece for those seeking to extract and use all that the planet has. When Cloud Barrett and Tifa attempt to save her from President Shinra at Shinra HQ, 
things take another dramatic turn. During the first five hours or so in Midgar, a character named Sephiroth keeps being mentioned in passing. Like Cloud claims to have once been, he was a genetically enhanced first-class super soldier for Shinra, who went missing and was presumed dead five years ago. Then during the attempt to save Aerith, everyone is captured. But suddenly the cell door locks deactivate, and you emerge to discover the Shinra building covered in blood with President Shinra, who up until now has been essentially the main antagonist of the game, murdered by Sephiroth. The dynamic of the game shifts, and the team embark on a quest across the world to defeat Sephiroth, who plans on deliberately casting an apocalyptic spell on the planet, so devastating the life stream, a current of energy that runs throughout the Earth, the source of the Mako energy Shinra reactors extract, will emerge and attempt to heal the planet, giving Sephiroth access to all of the planet's power, turning him into a god. On this adventure, the team are joined by Nanaki, aka Red 13, a talking lion wolf-like creature who was being experimented on in the Shinra building, and wants to help the team for a bit after their joint escape with Aerith. Around the world, the heroes are chased by Shinra's secret service, the Turks, and the new president, Rufus Shinra, the calculating late president's son, who seeks to tie up the loose ends of both Cloud's gang and Sephiroth to solidify his power. One of the game's crowning moments is when you emerge into the open world from Midgar. The main theme of the game roars to life. While it has a grand energy signaling the start of the open world portion of the game, our heroes starting a grand quest properly, there's also a downbeat energy to it, a lingering sadness you can hear in the mix. <laughs> Underlining that while the world is large and wondrous, it's also dying, nature is collapsing. It's a world on the brink and the people are to blame. It almost sounds like a church hymn, very fitting given the end times might be coming, and a certain character's favorite conservatory. It's a morose world that sticks with you. that with few words highlights how sad it can be to see a once beautiful land wither away. The abandoned coal mine in Coral is another area caked in this melancholia. As the team make their way across this crumbling, depressing landscape, they come across a small nest of birds. Amid all this death, a small, delicate gasp of life can still be felt. Maybe there's hope yet. Cloud details his past with Sephiroth to the team. That five years ago, the two were super soldiers on a mission for Shinra to Cloud and Tifa's hometown of Nibelheim. There, Sephiroth lost his mind upon discovering he wasn't just a super soldier infused with Mako energy to work for Shinra, but the result of a far more sinister experiment. Shinra had taken the DNA of a hostile alien life form called Genova, originally believed to be an ancient like Aerith, and injected it into a pregnant woman who would go on to birth Sephiroth. Disconnected from humanity, he comes to want the full power of the life stream to become like his godlike alien mother, and started his rampage by burning down Cloud's village. Cloud confronts Sephiroth, but his memories go blank there. His inability to recollect what happens past this point is odd enough, but Tifa, who was also there, starts acting strangely, almost like she's not convinced about Cloud's recollection of events. Even Cloud starts to doubt himself. Sephiroth is presented as such a great, intimidating villain. The first time you get to see him in action is in gameplay. We get to see the raw numbers as he annihilates a giant monster. Then after, when a powerful monster is in the way of the team early on, you can take a detour to catch a chocobo to speed past it, only to find the same type of monster eviscerated by Sephiroth around the next corner. Once the gang reach Nibelheim in the pursuit of Sephiroth, they find the town has been rebuilt and is now inhabited by Shinra employees pretending to be villagers to cover up the events of five years ago, as well as strange robed individuals marked with numbers who turn out to be people experimented on by Shinra, injected with Genova cells like Sephiroth in an attempt to replicate him. Coming here is an extremely eerie moment. Walking into this town that somehow, in spite of being populated, still manages to feel abandoned and haunted. It's not just Cloud and Tifa's past that we end up tripping over, though. Barrett's hometown of Coral now hate him. He encouraged the installation of a Mako reactor in the village years ago, eliminating the coal industry there. 
However, an apparent sabotage of the reactor that was installed there caused Shinra to burn down Coral in retaliation. Barrett's guilt over encouraging Shinra to move in there and his thirst for revenge become all-consuming. Barrett is an example of the nuanced characters in FF7 have. Brash, boastful, even comedic at times, yet hiding a deep layer of conflict underneath. Someone who feels tricked and used trying to make things right, but in the process becoming someone who even he begins to see as a walking monster, feeling unworthy to hold his adopted daughter in his arms. Another conflicted character is Reeve, a high-ranking official at Shinra in charge of urban development. He infiltrates the team with a robot cat he commands called Kate Sif. Reeve, while at the top of the totem pole, disagrees with Shinra's methods, and while he starts out trying to undermine the team, he's eventually inspired by their selflessness to join wholeheartedly. Regardless of Reeve's more sympathetic view of the population Shinra presides over, he had to have been an ambitious, deadly force to be where he is, and the team's philanthropic outlook on the world must be a bit of a culture shock to him. Someone ambitious but not quite as committed to the Shinra is another party member, Sid, a cranky pilot with dreams of going to space. Dreams that were destroyed when Shinra shuts down their space program after a failed launch, cancelled for safety concerns, causes the company to lose interest. He joins our Shinra-hating team when the company comes to threaten him to get some of his flying equipment. Promises, opportunity, they mean nothing to Shinra versus profit, and Sid's woeful tale puts that once again into perspective. Along the way, we also go through Cosmo Canyon, Red 13's home. Initially intending to stay there, he opts to continue along with the team, after feeling inspired by the unearthed legacy of his father, who stood up selflessly to invaders years ago. Much like Aerith, Red is a character with deep ties to nature, and by the time you reach his home in the canyon, the early game where you were running around the linear, gridlocked world of Midgar seems far away and long ago. It's easy to look back in surprise at how you managed to stomach such a place at all at the start, when it was all you knew of the world of FF7. There are two optional party members. One of them is Yuffie, a ninja thief from Wutai, a country modeled after pre-20th century East Asia that was summarily crushed in a war with Shinra that, you won't believe this, wanted to industrialize the region with Mako reactors. This pre-industrial culture, a simpler one more in tune with nature, has become a footnote now in this world, and it further highlights something important about FF7. Once, Final Fantasy was primarily a series that dealt with classic medieval fantasy. But FF7 wasn't just Square deciding to make an RPG in a sci-fi universe instead and calling it Final Fantasy, because the world of FF7 isn't really a sci-fi world. It is Final Fantasy, it is a medieval fantasy setting, but where the future arrived overnight out of nowhere. In a way, Square did to Final Fantasy what Shinra did to the planet here. It's a world where a sci-fi civilization was slapped on top of a medieval fantasy setting that had its swords and monsters and ninjas. It's a world that has hit fast forward through the latter half of the last millennium and all but skipped the 20th century. Powers from within the planet that once may have been referred to as magic are now called science, commodified into those small material balls you use to equip spells to your weapons. They took the magic of this fantasy world and turned it into science. Traditional weapons and modern weapons coexist. It's even a society that hasn't made it into space yet, in spite of its other technical leaps. The powers that be have so much else going on, they're barely even bothered to try space anymore. It makes for an exciting world to explore, because you're never quite sure what you're going to see around the next corner. Stumbling into Wutai, you get some more background on Yuffie. While her father and the people of Wutai have decided to all but concede to Shinra to avoid further violence, Yuffie is young and feels like her people have given up the fight. Naive, maybe, but it makes her eager to try and make some sort of difference in the Cloud Crew. She's a girl in conflict with herself, who abandons her family in the name of her family. On the subject of wild things to turn the corner and see, we have the second optional party member, Vincent Valentine. An immortal vampire you find in the basement of the lab in Nibelheim, his past is shrouded in mystery. He knows of Sephiroth and he knows of Hojo, the head scientist at Shinra responsible for all their mad experiments. 
Vincent feels a tremendous guilt over something he was unable to prevent years ago, joining the party to find redemption. He can also turn into this guy. The team tracks Sephiroth down to an ancient temple where he's attempting to acquire the Black Materia, a one-of-a-kind power he can use to cast Meteor, the apocalyptic spell, which works as described. It was hidden cleverly by the ancients, Aerith's ancestors. The team manages to retrieve it, but Cloud, under some kind of spell, hands it over to Sephiroth. At this point, Aerith disappears from the team. The gang track her down to the Forgotten Capital, once home to the Ancients, where she is conducting some sort of prayer. A beautiful, yet again eerie, abandoned town with a coral reef aesthetic. Not underwater, but still a civilization that feels buried under waves. Sephiroth tries to compel Cloud again, this time to kill Aerith, but Cloud resists, not that it ends up mattering. <laughs> Put aside the fact that the concept of the CGI movie is barely a few years old, or that exploring loss so viscerally was not the norm for gaming in 1997, Aerith's death is just a heartbreaking, brilliantly directed moment. There are no last words from her. She just goes limp the second Sephiroth's sword goes through her. He sicks a monster on the gang, but the boss battle music doesn't play. Aerith's theme overpowers the fight, the shock of the moment drowning out the energy of the battle. <laughs> and then Cloud has to let her go by letting her drift away. Killing a party member like this, one you've been led to believe is an option in a series of romance choices throughout the game, one you could sink time into developing stats and abilities for, is the perfect misdirect that makes this moment even more shocking than it already was gonna be. In 1997, video games were still largely seen in terms of thrills, maybe comedy, rarely ethical conundrums, but almost never palpable emotion. FF7 did this moment so well that it was largely responsible for starting to change that perception in the mainstream consciousness. The game that would make you cry, they called it. The first of its kind for most of the time. The scene is a fitting allegory for the game's conflict at large. Aerith, the humble flower girl, the church girl, represents Mother Earth, while Sephiroth, the result of man's twisted experiments, kills her with a smirk. It was such a well-done moment that it culturally overshadows what was probably a bigger twist yet to come. After the shell shock of these events, the team continue the hunt for Sephiroth to the northern crater. Here, they discover that the real Sephiroth has been there the entire time, encased in some kind of stasis. He has been using Genova cells to pollinate himself around the world, or to create Genova monsters to fight the team, conducting his business while encased up here at the top of the world. Through their Genova cells, he can also influence the cloak-wearing experiments from Nibelheim to congregate around him at the northern crater and do his bidding. But who else has he shown an ability to control? Cloud Strife. Sephiroth lays out a shocking revelation that Cloud was never a super soldier for Shinra, that he's a Sephiroth clone who believed himself to be Zack, the black-haired, actual Shinra super soldier who came to Nibelheim five years ago with Sephiroth. Cloud has tricked himself into believing he's this Zack guy, and Tifa all but confirms that this is true since she has no recollection of Cloud being at the tragedy five years ago, let alone being one of the Shinra super soldiers who came. She presumably kept this from Cloud to prevent him from spiraling, with his mental state already seeming sensitive. Cloud's body is ridden with Genova cells, so here Sephiroth recontextualizes the quest to find him, not as Cloud hunting Sephiroth down, but as Sephiroth merely calling Cloud to him just as he does any of his puppets, though Cloud is told that he is a failed puppet, someone with Genova cells that didn't take well enough to become a full-on Sephiroth drone like the hooded figures, and therefore was able to fight back now and again against Sephiroth's control. 
But while some elements of this hold up, such as Cloud not having made it as a Shinra super soldier, the idea that he was created from scratch five years ago at a lab in Nibelheim to be a Sephiroth clone makes less sense. If so, how does Tifa have memories of a Cloud when she was younger? Sephiroth speculates that maybe there was a different boy named Cloud and that the Genova cells were able to make use of those memories Tifa had somehow to create Cloud, which is an answer to be skeptical of. I mean, besides that, how would Cloud have even known about all the things that happened to Zack to insert himself into? Did Genova cells do that too, Sephiroth? The player is meant to find that stuff a little sketchy, but Cloud has now lost all hope regardless. Suffering a complete identity crisis, he's unable to fight back against Sephiroth's control anymore and facilitate Sephiroth's summoning of Meteor. While the rest of the gang reunite, Cloud goes missing, and after the loss of Aerith, I wouldn't put it past anyone from thinking the game maybe has just decided to delete another main character, but in a different way, revealing he's nothing but a deluded, empty puppet being controlled by the main villain the whole time. The game has been capable of doing some messed up things up to this point. There's some hope though for the time being. Sid arrives with an airship lifted from Shinra and the main overworld theme kicks in again, but this time with no shred of sadness. <laughs> The team is still kicking and is still gonna try. Cloud soon turns up, having fallen into the planet's life stream, he pops out on some remote island, comatose from Mako poisoning. At this point, while Tifa looks after Cloud, you get to go off around the world to steal Mako Shinra is trying to use to destroy Meteor for use in your own plans to confront the problem. With the planet starting to crack apart though, Tifa and Cloud fall into the life stream, where Tifa can finally help Cloud rebuild who he really was. Sephiroth only gave us half the truth. Cloud wasn't a super soldier, his mind had tricked him into thinking he was super soldier Zack during the Nibelheim incident, but he wasn't created there five years ago. He was the real Cloud from Tifa's childhood memories who joined Shinra's military, but just never made it into the super soldier program. He also was at the Nibelheim incident to see Sephiroth's turn firsthand. But as a simple infantryman, we saw in the background of Cloud's original retelling of the incident. When he arrived with Zack and Sephiroth at the town five years ago, he was too embarrassed to reveal his identity to Tifa and the other townsfolk, so he kept his infantryman helmet on, ashamed that he had only made it into the minor leagues at Shinra. And yet when Zack fails to stop Sephiroth, it's that insignificant infantryman who stands up to him and manages to cast him off into the life stream. <laughs> forcing Sephiroth to spend the next five years reconstructing himself in the northern caves, rather than taking over the world. Unfortunately, Cloud and Zack were then taken by Hojo to the lab in Nibelheim and experimented on there for half a decade. Cloud was injected with Mako and Sephiroth Genova cells, by the end all but given the same powers of a first-class super soldier just by force, alongside a heavy dose of Sephiroth genetics his brain fully scrambled in the process. Cloud now acknowledging his true past as a simple infantryman turned experiment, rejoins the team with a new sense of purpose. The team unite once again under the one mission of stopping Sephiroth and ending the nightmare Shinra has wrought. <laughs> After learning his true identity, Cloud loses some of his detached arrogance and becomes a little more down to earth, coming into himself as a true level-headed leader who can take this ragtag gang to victory. A ragtag gang who really represented RPG teams at their peak. Just an absolutely anarchic squad. Guy with a Gatling gun for an arm, robot cat, talking wolf, immortal vampire gunslinger. Sid finally gets his dream of going into space when the team get caught in the rocket Shinra is trying to launch at Meteor to stop it. Seeing the planet from space only drives home how small and fragile it is and how much the people need to work together to protect it. Vincent remains the most mysterious member of the team with very little backstory afforded to him. We do discover though that he was once a Turk working decades ago at the Nibelheim lab as a bodyguard. He had a deep respect and perhaps even romantically engaged one of the researchers there, Lucretia, but was unable to prevent her being used as a test subject, her unborn child being injected with Genova cells to birth Sephiroth. 
After it's too late, he becomes an unwilling test subject for Hojo and seals himself away in the basement as penance. When the team descend on Midgar to try and prevent Hojo from destroying the city, to further speed up Sephiroth's planet-cracking shenanigans, he claims to be the father of the child that would become Sephiroth, which is hinted at in Vincent's flashbacks. If you bring Vincent to the fight, he seems surprised by this, but finally snaps out of his self-loathing and redirects his anger towards the character truly responsible for the harm done, taking an Al Junova mutated Hojo to task in a battle atop Midgar. The journey is also made Barrett soften. As the end of the world really approaches, he realizes what's important to him, the people in his life, and that his callous work in Avalanche was more fueled by revenge than the love he has for others, a love which will guide his actions now instead. The team discover that Aerith's prayer was her attempt to use the White Materia, a materia passed down to her from the ancients, her ancestors, that could be used to cast Holy, a spell with the power to rebuff Meteor. Unfortunately, as long as Sephiroth is alive, blocking the spell, Holy can't emerge to stop Meteor. Rufus Shinra attempts to destroy Sephiroth and the giant monsters parading about the world called Weapons, creatures summoned by the planet to attack when the planet is being imminently threatened, and in this case it's being threatened by humanity, so it's not good news for Midgar. His plan to stop all these enemies is to use a very big gun powered by Midgar's macro reactors. He fires it and takes out one of the monsters, as well as a force field surrounding Sephiroth's lair in the northern crater, but not before his target gets a hit in that takes him out. Now only the Cloud crew remains to take him down. Before that though, the player can return to Nibelheim one last time, where Cloud will recall his final moments with Zack. Zack broke them out of the Nibelheim lab and almost managed to take a comatose mind broken cloud to Midgar, but before making it, he was executed by Shinra soldiers. Zack is presented here as an all around upbeat guy, and his words to the comatose cloud about his life and becoming a mercenary are potentially what imprints on Cloud his false memories of having been Zack, someone who had it all the top rank, the girls, and an optimism for the future no matter how bad things were. Even if Cloud takes on the background of this hero, his take on this persona ends up being arrogant and detached, a demeanor influenced partly maybe by trauma, but also it's perhaps more in line with Cloud's childhood idea of what a first-class soldier would be like. The finale lives up to its promise with a descent into the life stream at the Northern Crater, the biggest Genova monsters yet relentlessly assaulting the team. If the player meets certain requirements, all eight party members can join in on a part of the battle together too, bringing home the final team effort in gameplay. Once we throw down with Sephiroth, he confronts the player with seven minutes of dark opera and two minute long attack animations. So you know this is a final boss that's not messing around. In the twilight of the battle, Sephiroth tries to take control of Cloud one last time with the Genova cell still in Cloud's body, but Strife now knowing himself, is able to rebuff Sephiroth's influence completely, ending him once and for all. Cloud Strife is the antithesis of Sephiroth. Seph, a man who abandoned his humanity to be a slave to his origins as the roundabout child of an evil alien entity by trying to become a god at all costs, with about three backstories worth of prophesized destiny. While on the other hand, Cloud is someone who comes to discover that his origin and backstory are truly unspecial and manipulated by others, but he rises to the challenge to stop this wannabe god anyway. He chooses a path of his own and chooses to be special, regardless of whether he was destined to be or not, and wins. With Sephiroth gone, Aerith's holy spell can finally emerge to stop Meteor, but it looks like it might be too late. With her spirit rising from the life stream, the game comes full circle, opening with a caretaker of simple flowers, and ending with that same caretaker, but now as the caretaker of all of Mother Earth. As Meteor and Holy collide, we don't get to see what happens to everyone. Instead, we cut to 500 years in the future, where Red 13, whose species has an extremely long lifespan, is with his cubs arriving at a Midgar now overtaken by nature. The planet survives in the end and retakes what was taken from it. But what of everyone we got to know? The inhabitants of Midgar and the world at large? Our heroes and the people who caused the planet to reach the brink that it did? That's left ambiguous. A perfect way to end the game, with us wondering what the humanity of this game deserved in the end.
Final Fantasy VII is a game about identity, our relationship with the world around us, and how we choose to live our lives when thrust into worlds built by others. It's all presented and executed with devastating precision. Evocative visuals, peerless soundtrack, and relentless exciting action. Game mechanics and story come together to build up to its twists, to make them both effectively dramatic and relatable. Cloud was more like the player than we'd even thought possible at the beginning. Not just a merc looking for action and undecided about what to care about in this world he found himself in, but also someone in a way playing pretend, telling themselves they were some badass legendary warrior for the sake of circumstance, like the player slipping into the role of a hero in a game. The legacy of FF7 has been modelled a bit by all the different tones it presents and how individual scenes can spread and create an idea of what the game is like. Is it the game that finally made people cry, or is it largely a goofy adventure? where little guys bumble about getting into slapstick trouble. Well, it's both. It can be brutally emotional at times and send you on a lighthearted side quest with comedy antics and other. The reality is a game like FF7 wasn't meant to be rushed through. It was a world you could spend time in for months, and I'm sure many did, as they tried to make sense of things, figure out where to go and uncover all the secrets, with all the different tones reflecting the realities of a large and diverse world. Hell, a lot of what I've told you in this video are hidden plot points, basically. Secret scenes you might entirely miss, unless you live and breathe the game beyond just the next boss fight. Don't enter this house in Gongaga with Aerith in your party, and you won't be explicitly told about how Zack was her boyfriend way back when. Don't return to Nibelheim in Disc 3 unprompted, and you won't even see Zack's final end. What little backstory there is about Vincent is hidden up in some cave in a mountain somewhere. FF7 is a great self-contained story. One of gaming's best, with a satisfying yet ambiguous ending. But if you're up for living out the what-if scenario of this world carrying on, then stick around, because there's a lot of interesting stuff to look at. In the mid-2000s, some further FF7 projects were developed. In 2004, before Crisis, FF7 was released for phones in Japan. The game was a prequel where you played as Shinra's secret service, the Turks, years before FF7. The main antagonist was a more extreme, early incarnation of Avalanche, secretly funded by Rufus Shinra to weaken his father's grip of the company so he could eventually take over. This Avalanche would go completely off the rails, though, and try to wipe out humanity itself, in an attempt to save the planet, returning all humans to the life stream. This plan is thwarted by the Turks, whose perspective of the Nibelheim incident with Sephiroth, Zack, and Cloud we get to see, as well as the view of the latter duo's eventual escape years later. This game was never localized and is no longer playable, so there's not a whole lot I can say about it, unlike the real main course of the return of the FF7 world, which was the 2005 film, Advent Children. Taking place two years after the game, this movie depicts a world in which humanity largely survives the clash between Meteor and the Lifestream, and are trying to pick up the pieces amidst a new illness predominantly infecting children, and an attempt by Sephiroth to return. His body gone, but his will still lingering somewhere in the planet. It's awesome to see the FF7 squad fight Bahamut, or Cloud vs. Sephiroth, all with such unhinged direction in a literal visual language, but the most interesting aspect is Cloud having to come to terms with his guilt over losing his loved ones in FF7. The movie helps better contextualize FF7, because when you think about it, what is the story of FF7? It's a story of good versus evil where the main heroes die before they can save it. Zack and Aerith of the upbeat classical hero archetypes, but they don't make it. They tragically die. Instead, leading the charge to save the world is left to some guy, a sad sack who was never destined to be offered the role of hero. Someone who tried to become a soldier to impress others, and when self-deluded enough to believe he had, became a merc for hire, not that interested in helping humanity at large. He's of course inspiring for when he steps up, regardless of his true origin. But still, one can only imagine the level of survivor's guilt he must be feeling after the dust has settled. The beautiful people that inspire inspired him, whose upbeat attitude that never wavered like his, are gone. He probably feels like it's almost unfair that he remains. Seeing him overcome these feelings of self-loathing is satisfying to see in the film. Watching him eventually help stop a disease and smack Sephiroth back into the life stream is just a bonus. Advent Children also helps underline why Cloud never made it into Soldier, and received his Mako powers through a series of chance incidents instead. Cloud doesn't have the most unwavering mental fortitude. Second-guessing himself, stumbling between resolve and despair, you can see why he might not have passed to the psych eval to be put forward for such experiments. 
before Hojo just scooped him off the ground in Nibelheim. In 2006, a new home console game came out, this time a third-person shooter starring Vincent Valentine, the mysterious party member who got the least attention in the original game. In the PS2's Dirge of Cerberus, a year after Advent Children, Vincent is called in by Reeve and others to help take on Deep Ground, a group of Shinra soldiers and super soldiers who had been hidden in a secret city under Midgar this whole time. Now they've turned on the rest of humanity after escaping containment. It was cool to get to explore certain FF7 areas in full real-time 3D for the first time here. Once Vincent takes the fight to Deep Ground's home base, their underground city, you get the best level in the game though. The transition down there is pretty effective, with Vincent heading first through some sterile corridors, the roots of the tree that is Shinra HQ twisting deep beneath the earth until you emerge in the decrepit lost city. This is where the promise of Dirge of Cerberus feels the most realized. Vincent Valentine fighting his way through a forgotten city, the thick sad mood of this town with a steel sky threatens to overshadow all the action happening as he blasts through. A man on a singular mission. Turns out that Deep Ground's leader, Vice, has been under the control of Hojo, who before dying, uploaded himself to the internet and downloaded himself into Vice. He wants to become the godlike being Omega, whose purpose is to absorb the life stream of the planet when it's undergone too much harm to repair, and then travel the stars with it to create new life elsewhere. It's not good for humanity, who will be left with no life stream and no planet if that happens. Traveling space as a god has become appealing to Hojo. Vincent channels the power of Omega's counter god, Chaos, whose cells Lucretia injected into him way back when. This was his level 4 limit break attack in FF7, if you remember. Vincent uses this power to defeat the awakened Omega before it can do any harm to humanity. In a post credit scene, a mysterious character we'd come to know in a later game as Genesis comes to take away the discarded vice for some unknown plan. This is about as far as the timeline of FF7 goes, 500 years into the future glimpse aside. So what happens next here has never been resolved. But just keep in mind, I guess, that all roads lead to this guy. In 2007, Crisis Core was released for the PSP. This prequel game lets you play as Zack before the events of FF7. We explore his work for Shinra, his touching relationship with Aerith, and eventually the Nibelheim incident and his sacrifice. The game begins at the tail end of Shinra's war with Wutai and then focuses on a conflict between Shinra and two first-class ranking super soldiers in the organization going rogue, Angeal and Genesis. Like Sephiroth, these two were injected with Genova cells, but in a more roundabout way and after birth, not being quite the specimen Sephiroth is. As a result, the pair suffer from degradation, a kind of advanced aging, turning on Shinra for being responsible for making them into these human weapons with a cell by date, while they try to find a cure for Genesis's degradation, which has already kicked in. One of my favorite scenes in the game happens early on when Sephiroth, Genesis, and Angeal are messing around in training. These three supermen kill time comparing who's the baddest in between quoting poetry at each other. All the while, some teenage rookie infantryman nobody in the basement somewhere one day will kick the ass of the strongest, most pretentious guy there. A fitting irony looms over the moment. Genesis and Angeal fight their war against Shinra. Angeal loses his life and eventually Genesis finds some special materia that lets him survive his degradation, although Zack beats him up when doing so turns him into a monster for a bit. Deep Ground members then take Genesis away, to be seen again one day in Dirge of Cerberus, and uh, that's all well and good. But the reason you're really here is to get a closer look at Zack's end. When escaping the Nibelheim lab with Comatose Cloud, Shinra catches up with Zack, and we get to partake in his final stand, this time as a player. After the start of the game, where Zack is seen following orders and propaganda, helping an invading army carry out a war he has no stake in, seeing him end the game fighting for himself, for what he believes in, even if it's a battle he has no hope of winning, is uplifting and inspiring, if of course bittersweet. The music that plays here is the perfect choice for this moment of self-actualization. The track is tragic, but with a rocking guitar flavoring that tragedy, with the spice of freedom Zack is experiencing, if only for a brief battle. Modulating phase. 
As it becomes clear he isn't going to win though, his battle roulette wheel, which displays various people he knows when moves are triggered in combat, starts glitching out, settling slowly on Aerith the girl he loves as he collapses. The still out of it cloud emerges from the rubble and in the best scene in the game, we get the twisted moment Zack unknowingly imprints onto Cloud, who disassociates from the harrowing moment, the death of his friend, by becoming him. You'll be my living legacy. You're living legacy. On some subconscious level, Cloud promises Zack he won't forget him, a promise he will fulfill much later when he snaps out of this delusion instilled through trauma and the cocktail of alien DNA he's been injected with for half a decade. The final moments showing a bloodied, mind-scrambled Cloud covered in blood with Zack's sword limping towards Midgar, where FF7 will begin, is an incredible bit of imagery. As discussed, I think it's a big combination of things that brings on Cloud misremembering himself as Zack. Trauma, the Genova experimentation, his desire to regain control. But I think one of the saddest factors is maybe how his mind just can't bear that this tragedy has happened. That a good person like Zack was robbed from the world. And he can't accept it, he won't accept it, even if he has to become Zack to keep him alive. The game ends by showing Cloud riding the train into the initial bombing mission at the start of the original FF7. Now though, the dark reality of his twisted up mind hangs over the scene in a way it didn't when you saw the same moment for the first time booting up the 97 game. In this sense, the games loop full circle right back to the 2020 remake. But before that, there was a break in game releases with other forms of media taking their place. In 2009, a book of short stories was released called On the Way to a Smile, though not translated into English until 2018. It's a prequel to Advent Children and features perspective chapters from Tifa Barrett, Red 13, Yuffie, and Rufus Shinra, as well as Denzel, a child who Cloud and Tifa adopted in Advent Children. Tifa and Barrett's chapters have them mulling over the guilt of their actions and trying to forge new paths. Yuffie is trying to find a cure for the virus in Advent Children and not feeling great about coming up short, and Red 13 mulls over his fears of losing his friends, as his physiology means he will outlive his human loved ones. He personifies these fears with the name Gilligan, and after closer examination, realizes he's dreading specifically the final shot of FF7, being in that future Midgar covered in grass without his current friends. However, he finds comfort in Vincent, who as an immortal, will still be around, and the two agree to continue hanging out, at least once a year. The chapter from Rufus Shinra's perspective explains how he escaped the blast in FF7, and I bet you're wondering how he got out of that one, since it looked pretty point blank. Uh, so his father built an escape route for him in the office, a big water park funnel slide that would take him all the way down the building. But Dad Shinra also thought that retreating was for epic lamos. So to mock his son, if he ever resorted to using it, he marks the button to open the hatch with a big L that stood for loser. When Rufus reaches the bottom of the slide, he then emerges into a room with a big L on the ceiling. I'm not making this up. Rufus escapes after he fails to stop Sephiroth's plan uh, by jumping down the L slide into the massive L room, which, you know, is insane, but fitting given everything, I guess. The Denzel chapter involves him recounting to Reeve what it was like to be a human in Midgar experiencing the events of FF7 from that regular person perspective, living day by day with parts of the city collapsing and with giant meteors overhead threatening to crash land. An old woman he ends up living with sacrifices herself for him when Meteor nearly wipes out Midgar, and it's revealed at the end this was Reeve's mother. Reeve expresses gratitude to Denzel for keeping his mother company in her final days, instead of her being alone in the house he bought her. The Denzel chapter was adapted into a one-off animated episode that same year, packaged with the Blu-ray release of Advent Children Complete, a re-release of the film that features new scenes and visual tweaks. It integrated some more material from the ending of Crisis Core, and on the whole is a lot easier to immediately understand than the original film, as it gives itself more time to breathe and explain itself. 
In 2011, another book came out, although again only translated into English many years later. This time in 2019. A novel, The Kids Are Alright. Another prequel to Advent Children, this one centers on Evan Townsend, a young bumbling man who runs a detective agency in the post-Meteor Midgar. He discovers he's the illegitimate son of President Shinra, and therefore Rufus Shinra's brother. While looking for his lost mother, and with the Turks in tow, he has a run-in with Kadaj, the villain of Advent Children, the slightly off-clone of himself Sephiroth creates from the life stream to find a way to bring him back to life. Evan, not realizing he's in a prequel book, can't really change much of what happens, but he gets some personal growth, good for him. Finally, in 2020, we received Final Fantasy VII Remake, which at first glance is a recreation of the Midgar segment from the start of the original FF7. Recreated with modern graphics and tech, a new combat system, alongside including freshly animated cutscenes with voice acting. But it soon becomes apparent more is going on than just an alternate telling of the events of FF7, and that instead we're dealing with at minimum a different timeline of events, or even potentially a sequel to what came before. If you're unacquainted with the original FF7, you're all but guaranteed to be confused by this game, which assumes you already know a lot of what already happened, which is at minimum a bold direction for this game to go in. But the hints that this was going to happen were there pretty early on, before the game came out. Very few remakes put the word remake in the title. Remakes that exist to emulate the original and serve as an alternate telling of the same thing usually run with the exact same title. If that's how this game had wanted to present itself, it would have just been called Final Fantasy VII Part One. But instead it drew attention to its status as a recreation of something old. Remake feels like it has a double meaning here. In some cases, it refers to the game FF7 being remade, but it may also refer to the in-game context that the world itself is being changed here. Events in Remake seem to be transpiring as they did in the original game to begin with. The bombing mission at the start plays much like it did before, albeit now with the player getting to control the characters directly, experiencing the extreme impact of the Buster Sword yourself, swift and fast but brutally strong. The first boss gets extended into this 10 minute orchestrated epic battle, and it's just such an unhinged reimagining of the original. You can't help but be impressed on some level by the audacity of it all. The best inclusion in the remake is how characters can now banter in gameplay. In a story so much about the developing relationship of these very different people, getting to see them develop during the action is both exciting and rewarding. You get to feel like they're really interacting spontaneously as they juggle talking and fighting at once. Less talking, more shooting. How about less this from you? Keep it up, man. Yeah, you too. After the bombing mission though, events keep threatening to play out differently than they did in 97. Things are constantly threatening to go a different way. But every time that's about to happen, a bunch of angry spirits show up to try and get things back to the way they were in the original. One might call it a blunt metaphor for fan expectations of remakes, but whether you can see them or not, most remakes have destiny ghosts trying to get things back on track, or trying to kill off characters who died in the original story. There's this impulse when playing remakes that's hard to avoid. It's difficult to get caught up again in something you already experienced years ago. And when you don't, instead you end up sitting around, anticipating stuff you've already seen, getting ready to judge their new execution. The characters in a remake aren't allowed to surprise you. FF7 Remake personifies this invisible force within the game's story, a force that is putting the characters on a one-way track. Perhaps best described as arbiters of fate that they may just end up resenting by the end. Literal creatures do the work of preserving the original story, forcing the characters to recreate the memories of the original for us, even when they're not that interested in doing so. Aerith also acts weird, like she knows what's going to happen, almost like she has knowledge of the original game on some level. Sephiroth also takes a much bigger interest in Cloud than he did at the start of 97, and by the end of the game takes us through a portal to another Midgar. So he has to be in some way a different guy to his original incarnation, well before the events of FF7 threaten to change here. But there's still a version of Sephiroth here going through the motions of the events of the original game, like murdering President Shinra and taking Jenova's body. So who knows what the master plan is? Destiny ghosts aside, 
The game has a few extra nods added to past FF7 content that the game could be implying were lurking in the background, out of sight, in the original FF7, and aren't necessarily a twist in the new timeline. Leslie and Kyrie make an appearance, these two are part of Evan Townsend's detective agency in The Kids Are Alright, and we get to see here what they were up to years earlier. <laughs> Running into them, I nearly shed a tear, going through all that extra material paying off in the games. The older, more extreme avalanche from Before Crisis is made reference to, both both at the start of the game and in the DLC chapter, Intermission, where Yuffie infiltrates Midgar and gets tangled up in a fight with Deep Ground from Dirge. Yuffie is working alongside a third, new, more peaceful version of Avalanche, an organization that has gotten far more complicated than in the original when it was just like four people. Sephiroth also displays the ability to use the Genova mutated hooded figures from Nibelheim as vessels he can possess and appear around the world as, while presumably his body is in the Northern Crater. This is instead of in the original where he just sort of pollinated around the world as Genova cells that can become him. Though he doesn't attempt to do that to Cloud who had similar injections. Maybe since Cloud is the quote unquote unsuccessful attempt at that experiment, he can't fully pull it off with him. In the same way Cloud was able to resist Sephiroth's compulsion a bit in the original, unlike the hooded figures. Anyway, back to the Destiny Ghosts. At the end of the game, a destiny ghost spirit singularity of some kind is triggered after their constant intervention, and the characters decide to fight the ghosts so they can be allowed to change their fates as they were presented in the original game. They do this by following Sephiroth into a parallel Midgar, where the ghosts lose their minds at all these interlopers dropping in. There, an epic battle with the ghosts and Sephiroth ensues, where the party subdues Sephiroth and eradicates the destiny ghosts. Sephiroth proposes some kind of alliance with Cloud, who rejects him. But Seph leaves him with this cryptic message. Seven seconds till the end. Time enough for you, perhaps. But what will you do with it? Returning to their reality, not much has changed. Destiny has altered a little bit though, in that Biggs, a character who died in the original, has survived. Presumably in the world our heroes return back to, perhaps due to the team owning the ghosts. However, in the parallel Midgar the heroes just fought in, suggested to be another world by the design of a mascot of a packet of crisps, not matching the one we've seen throughout the rest of the game, Zack survives his infamous final stand in Crisis Core, allowing him to continue his journey to Midgar with Comatose Cloud. Was this destined to happen in this alternate world? Did our party's actions have some effect on destiny taking this course here? What did Sephiroth want from this other Midgar? What will Cloud do with his seven seconds, or has he subconsciously already used them for something? The answers remain vague, as the FF7 party walk off into the rest of FF7 FF7, and in a separate world, Zack and a cloud who never got the chance to fully brainwash himself walk towards Midgar. All of this brings us to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. which I recently got to try the final build of, although I can only discuss the first couple of chapters. Plus, there's an absolutely wild prologue chapter that I won't spoil. In chapter one, the team get to hear Cloud's misremembered version of the Nibelheim incident before taking off into the world in search of Sephiroth. But what of all the mysteries put forward at the end of Remake? On the 29th of February, more answers await. On leap day of all days, the day that sometimes is and sometimes isn't. What better day to release this game about a character who misremembers his life? A very classic Square Enix metatextual marketing move, using our one real world ephemeral calendar date to birth their disassociative mystery game on. So far, the best part of Remake seems to have been built on here, the team-based action gameplay where now it's not just a case of switching characters, but you can also unlock moves and attacks that allow the player to control the actions of multiple heroes at once. A single button press can have multiple characters perform actions at the same time, which is absolutely the type of play you'd want this story about misfit loners coming together to focus on. Returning from the original FF7 is also a relationship system, where you can develop your standing with your party members. Yeah place I made that promise to you. You remember the dress I wore? 
It was one of my favorites. Although the system is now more overt. No doubt this will have an impact on certain scenes later in the game. The world is dauntingly big, but more importantly than that, perhaps, is how the world is being fleshed out with more side activities and minigames, which I think we all missed in FF7 Remake and FF16. A card game the populace enjoys can be participated in now, and as a certified Triple Triad fan, I'm looking forward to exploring its mechanics. Getting the chocobo for crossing the swamp after calm also unlocks a little course. It's extra little tasks like these you can sink time into, they let a big RPG world like this feel more like a world you can be a living participant in, rather than it being just a series of nice looking rooms for combat to take place in. Another improvement over Remake is how movement through the world is handled. Characters can now navigate rockier terrain and vault over obstacles. In Remake, it felt much more like you were locked into this tight grid of movement. The change here was kind of necessary given how much more exploration there's going to be across untamed lands. Combat also feels a little faster and more fluid. Hard to put into words, but your movement feels a bit smoother. Extra movement tweaks compounding here for an overall faster, silkier pace. This game being on PS5 right out of the gate doesn't hurt either either, as we get to play day one immediately at 60 FPS. Players can unlock summon spells by beating said summon in combat, but what I like is how you can lower the fight's difficulty by finding hidden collectibles out in the world. This kind of difficulty modulation where hardcore combat fans can gain these summons early by taking on a harder iteration of their fight, but players less good at combat can work on unlocking them through exploration. The amount of playable characters has, of course, expanded. Almost immediately, you'll get access to Red 13, who's fully playable this time around. Picking a squad will be more of a factor than it was in Remake, and thankfully you can store team presets to access lineups you like quickly. While only three characters can be fully accessible in the fight at once, teammates not in your immediate party aren't fully lost. You can still command them to jump in for special attacks when the chips are down. The amount of options here seems pretty overwhelming. We've finally circled back around to the original 97 game in terms of options and choices, both in gameplay and story. One of the main things you'll have to get over though is Sephiroth leaving your party after the Nibelheim flashback. <laughs> That's sort of unavoidable as he's in a flashback, and it's still cool how much effort was put into his play regardless, but I ended up wanting more time with him. The finesse yet brutality of his katana is awesome to wield, and his swag is just on another level. Shouldn't be too hard. To get an idea of how big this game is, I spent about five hours playing the game before reaching the mines that connected the Calm area to the Junon area in the original. That's just the open world's first two towns in the 97 game. In only a few days, this retrospective will be incomplete, and by quite a bit, if the potential length of rebirth is anything to go on. I've done my best to summarize and make observations where fitting here, but the FF7 series is fairly open to interpretation in places. Motivations, the mechanics of the story, they're often up for debate. This is a fantasy after all, and fantastical elements create situations that one can interpret from different angles. It's not the sort of thing that's easy to wickify succinctly. There's little bits of the saga I didn't have time to touch upon as well. It's a deep well that I'd like to return to in more detail someday, maybe when the new trilogy is wrapped up. It's the combination of grandiose mystery and very down-to-earth human emotion, the battle of insecurity and resolve, that makes the world of FF7 so fantastical yet relatable. A captivating and irresistible place to go back to. Oh, the video's over, don't mind me. I'm just looking for the L button.